things. I have to spend a good bit of time as we go along um, showing you why much of what you're seeing on television or reading in the newspapers or listening to on the radio really isn't very useful. And the way to get at that is this way. Um, this is the most severe crisis of capitalism in my lifetime. And I have a lot of white hair. So you can see, given a simple comparison of you and me, that if it's the most severe crisis of capitalism in my lifetime, it's in your lifetime too, with the exception of a few folks in the room who are older than me. Uh, anyone who tells you that this is a minor problem, a casual problem, a problem restricted to one or another part of the world, or one or another segment of the economy, notice the frequent use of the phrase financial crisis, as if it was somehow limited to that area. Anyone who tells you that hasn't been paying attention and you should be extremely skeptical. Another reason to be skeptical is no one in the academic world, which I work with, and almost no one in the government, and 95% of those in the business community, so all academics, all government, and 95% of people in the business community did not see this coming. Since you're listening to the same people now explaining to you what is the minimum you ought to have in your mind. If you notice, though, I left out the 5% of the business community. They did know. I am sorry to say that the academic community, myself included, didn't know. Some of us said things were looking bad. But you know there's the old joke about the left, or about Marxist economists, which if you haven't heard it, I will now tell it to you, <laughs> that Marxist economists are very proud for having predicted 10 of the last four depressions. <laughs> which, which they did. And so, you know, even making allowances for my name, if the little kid cries wolf a lot, well then you don't pay attention after a while. But there were some people who really understood it. And they're not leftists, and they're not e economists, and they're not academics. They are a group of people in the business community, sometimes called contrarians or bears. But they started writing years ago <coughs> about something which they, as people in charge of investing huge amounts of money, had to pay attention to, because they were reaching the conclusion that uh, something terrible is building up, and to protect their clients' money, they would have to act accordingly. Uh, and so it was really in the business community that I first began to get the information and to get the analysis that rang true for me and rang a lot better, made a lot more sense to me than what I was getting anywhere else, so I began to pay attention. Nowhere is this kind of thinking and writing more concentrated than in the city of New York. So you are not only in the place where it all blows up, but you're also in the place with the greatest and most sophisticated criticism. But it came from the business community, from the contrarians. If you're interested in looking at this, let me mention some things. There's a very, very big fund of mutual funds and hedge funds and so on in Texas, run by used to be run by two brothers named Tice, T-I-C-E. But if you go to something called prudentbear, one word, dot com, you will get there a series of comments, commentaries that are about the best there is. Another website is called Seeking Alpha. You'll find it there, too. There is a professor at the Stern School of Business here at NYU named Nouriel Rubini. Read, when you see his name, read it. If you, and you will see his name a lot, he gets a lot of press. There's an economist who works for Morgan Stanley Bank named Stephen Roach, he's another one. But notice what I'm mentioning to you, these are the biggest, most establishment kinds of people, but they're the ones who, if you go back and you take a look, understood what's going on. 
but I'm not like them because I come at this from a critical perspective. All of those people like capitalism, and just so we all understand each other, I don't. <laughs> so that, well, that's an important difference, you know, and you either like something or you don't, then it matters. I don't, so I'm, I'm not interested in saving it. I'm not interested in making it work better. Other people do that, and I'm glad they work at that. But I'm not going to do that, and that's not where I'm coming from, so you should be aware of that. Uh, and believe it or not, I have, as I told an old friend a few minutes ago, um, I am in a bit of a whirlwind the last about five weeks now. Uh, just to give you a very personal note, in the last five weeks, I have done more speaking on radio, television, and to audiences than I did in the previous 25 years. <laughs> I actually sat down and, and kind of counted. I don't sleep much. If I fall asleep while talking to you, you will understand. Uh, the only other thing that's interesting is that in the past, when I did some public speaking, people would explain to me, once they knew who I was, that they wanted me to speak despite the fact that I'm a Marxist. Now they call me up and ask me to speak because I'm a Marxist. <laughs> and that is as good an index that something is changing in America as you could get. Uh, I don't have to explain myself anymore. Five days ago, I got a long distance call, just to give you an example, from London, from the BBC. They needed to have a Marxist interpretation of the collapse of the United States. That's a quote. <laughs> if you had asked me six months ago whether it could be possible that the BBC would want me to comment on the collapse of the United States, I would have thought this was a very fanciful dream. But uh, I was teaching a class, so I couldn't do it. So I gave it, uh, I gave them the name of a former student of mine. Uh, you may know his name, David Ruccio, and who is a Marxist economist, who is a professor at, you'll enjoy this, Notre Dame University in Indiana. And the BBC called David and got him to explain, from a Marxist perspective, what is going on here in the collapse of the United States, which was then aired on BBC World Service. So things are changing. Let me turn then to an explanation which will be peppered by things I think you need to be sure you're not fooled by when you get the, the, the press rendition. Well, let me start right off. This part, the first part, is about what happened. How do we get to this situation? How do we understand it? This is not a financial crisis. This is an economic crisis. It touches everything. To think of it as a financial crisis would be to make the same mistake as going to a doctor to explain, say, that your elbow hurts. And when the doctor says, well, good, we'll do some tests, just to, you, no, 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 you say, it's the elbow. Just look at the elbow. It's just at the elbow. Uh, you probably should get another doctor, if, you, if the doctor went along with that, because you want to see whether where it shows up <coughs> means it's just there, or whether where it shows up could be caused by something chemical, something physical, something psychological. It's a big question, and a good doctor will do those tests. We have an economic system that is in serious trouble. And it's not in serious trouble here or there or over here. It's in serious trouble everywhere. One of the reasons why you may have been surprised when you saw the great bailout plan be passed, and it seemed to make no difference to the downward collapse, that's the reason. The people on Wall Street are aware, because they have to be, it's their job, that the um, excrement has flown into the cooling equipment, and it's everywhere. <laughs> it's just everywhere. And uh, some of you took a while to do that. Yes. Um, it's everywhere, and it's everywhere regionally, all over the world. It's everywhere in every industry, and that should not be a surprise. Once you understand where this all came from, this did not come out of some peculiarity of banks. It did not come out of some new form of credit. 
We have had problems with our banks. We have had new forms of credit. But to try to limit the explanation to those things is, as I'll try to show you, a serious mistake. Another mistake, which follows from the first one. The distinction between Wall Street and Main Street. I have, frankly, I have the faintest idea what purpose this distinction makes other than a kind of bizarre rhetoric that is completely contradicted by every fact. Let me assure you that in the hoopla of the last five or six years, everybody had their fingers in the pot. The little bank on Main Street was every bit as deep into this as the big bank on Wall Street. Indeed, the two banks were constantly working out the deal together. Their only disagreement was on how to divide the big rich pot between them. Every business in America was dependent on this wild boom. Not just banks, everybody. Little statistic. Two-thirds of the economic upswing of the last four or five years before everything went bad was located in what we call in, in economics the housing industry. What does that mean? It means building homes, building the furniture that goes in the home, making the appliances that go in the home, making the automobile that sits in the driveway next to the home. Our economy was dependent on the housing industry. It took care of, it accounted for three quarters of the job growth. And how was it possible for housing to boom? because of the banks and the credit system that made that possible. The banks made money, but the housing industry made money. And with the housing industry, the transportation. And on and on, everybody was involved. Now that everything turns sour, everybody's pointing somewhere else where the blame lies. They weren't pointing when the times were good. Everybody got in on it and everybody is now in deep trouble. The notion of a distinction between Wall Street and Main Street is bizarre and seems to me only understandable as an attempt again to localize, to minimize, to, to not face that this is a systemic problem. How did we get here? If you will bear with me, we economists are kind of spastic, and if we can't draw something on the board, we feel as though we're not doing our job. So it'll be very minimal. I will not bore you with mathematical fanciness. Uh, our profession is completely polluted by that mentality, but I won't foist it on you. Here's the problem. For a long time, from about 1820 to 1970, that's a long time, 150 years, the United States was a remarkable capitalist country. Because here's what happened. If you look at those 150 years, they're remarkable because every decade, 10 year, 10 year, 10, every decade, the real wages of American workers on average went up. By real wage, I mean the amount of money they got paid in relationship to the prices they had to pay for the goods they bought with that money, the real wage. Money wages adjusted for prices. In other words, the American working class did better every year, even in the Great Depression. Because even though the wages went down, the prices went down even a bit more. It's remarkable. There's probably no working class in modern capitalist history that had 150 years of unbroken rising wages. It made Americans bizarre. <laughs> Well, it did. It made them very different because nobody else had this. For example, Americans began to think that there was something peculiar about the United States. It just was, ready, blessed. <laughs> well, Americans being what they are, you have to explain it in the most readily available way. You look up. <laughs> We're blessed. God likes us better than anybody else. <laughs> Well, that was very popular, that view. And now here's another view. Um, Americans work hard. Or Americans just have, oh, this is good, leftists like this one. We're just sort of a 
democratic. Why that has anything to do with this, I never understood, but it's one of those things that makes it about as much sense as the looking up. No less sense, anyway. But be that as it may, Americans got used to it. Not a tough thing to get used to. Americans began to believe that it's somehow built into your condition as an American that the grandchildren will not be as well off as, excuse me, the grandchildren will be better off than the children, and the children will be better off than the parents. It, it just gets better. Whatever kind of house you have, your kids will have a nicer one. And whatever kind of car you have, et cetera, et cetera. It was expected. And a population that lives like that can be forgiven if it develops the following idea. I measure my success in life by the neighborhood I live in, the house I have, the clothes I wear, the car I drive. I can show you that I'm a successful person. Look! Right? Americans, more than any other people on earth, measure their own sense of importance, their wealth, as human beings, by what they have. They're much more focused on the object than on relationships, important as relationships are. Americans, as everyone who has ever thought about it knows, are very consumption-oriented. There's a reason why the advertising industry was born in this country and has never elsewhere become as important in any culture as it is here. Right? So that's where I want to begin the story. For most of these 150 years, we can draw two lines that look very similar, the way I've done them here. The upper line is the growth in the productivity per worker. Very simple idea. The, the bunch of goods and services each worker produces. And the line goes up because over time, workers get better trained, have better and more machinery, so of course each worker produces more and more stuff. And for those 150 years, the, un the line below is the line of the rising wages. As workers became more productive, they shared in the extra output their labor was able to produce. Their wages went up for 150 years. American capitalism was a charmed place. Then in the mid-1970s, that history stopped. And I would argue that most Americans still have not figured it out and certainly not come to terms in their own minds with it. Glimpses, people have all kinds of bits and pieces of the story, but they kind of don't see the story as a whole. Why did, by the way, just for the record, from the mid-1970s to the present, the real wages of the American working class have gone exactly nowhere. <coughs> the amount of money an average worker gets in the United States today, adjusted for the prices he or she pays, is a little less than it was in the late 1970s, right now. That's shown here by having this line flatten out. It doesn't go up anymore. This is the wage line. This is the productivity line. Workers kept becoming more and more productive in the last 30 years. That's the era of the computer. 30 years ago, everybody didn't have a computer. Now everybody does. And because everybody has a computer, we are able to have each person produce a lot more than he or she could before. So the productivity, the amount of stuff produced by each worker keeps going up. But the wage doesn't. Why? Several reasons. In the 1970s, remember, we were a good 25, 30 years after World War II. The end of World War II, every country that might have competed with the United States was destroyed. The big other capitalist countries, Britain, France, Germany, Japan, wiped out. The United States had a fantastic free time from the 1945 end of the war to the 1970s was a charm time. The, the rest of the world had to slowly rebuild its economies by buying American stuff. Americans had the job to produce. But by the 1970s, the rest of the world had rebuilt. 
And Japan and Europe understood real well that in a world dominated by the United States, if you're going to rebuild your economy from war, you better focus on doing what those Americans do, since they control everything, by either making it better or making it cheaper. And they went to work to do that, which is why you drive a Toyota. They, they figured out how to do it. Their life depended on it. If they didn't outdo the United States, they couldn't have a capitalist industry in these countries, so they did. And American companies began to discover real competition. Now, you know, like all of our business leaders talk about the importance of competition. It's the last thing they want. <laughs> they hate it. Every day, I work with boards of directors. I can assure you half of what they do is to avoid, evade, and crush competition wherever it rears its ugly head. They pay specialists to go out and talk about it, but they hate it. Academics celebrate them. So what did American industry do? In order to compete better, they decided a key thing is to lower wages. That way, even if they couldn't make the stuff better, they could make it cheaper. And you all know what they did. The American, in the 1970s, the American industry began a process that was called the export of capital, more recently called outsourcing, just moving production to where the workers are cheap, leaving the United States, emptying out. Many of you who ever traveled to the cities across New England, you know what I mean. Those brick buildings, three or four stories high, running a block long, in which, you know, 12 sculptors work. <laughs> <laughs> Finished, dead, gone. The second thing, and then that lowered wages because the jobs were going out, leaving behind people without jobs who, in order to get a job, would have to offer themselves for less than other people were getting as they began to compete for jobs. The second thing that began in a big way in the 1970s was the pressure of business who didn't want to go abroad to, to have cheap workers to do it the better way. You bring the cheap workers here. Immigration, take off. We bring a vast array of people from every corner of the world with particular emphasis on Central America, which is why every restaurant in New York City is brought to you by Mexican people. And they came in, and they're willing to work real cheap, because half of them will be thrown out of the country if their employer rats them out, which they understand, and so they work for very little. We also had another phenomenon. The computerization of every kind of production made workers redundant, threw workers out, made workers unnecessary. You put all those things together, and you add a few more, which I don't have time to go into, but we can in the question, and the wages stopped rising. Wages flattened out. Okay, you don't need an advanced degree here to understand. If the amount of stuff each worker produces, and therefore his employer has more and more to sell per worker, goes up. But what you pay the worker doesn't, that's called profit. That difference there between what the worker produces and what you pay him is the profit. So starting in the 1970s, the United States experienced a flattening out of wages, coupled with a continued rise of productivity, with the result that we produced in the United States the greatest boom in profits in our history. And the story begins with this unprecedented profit explosion. Who gets profits? Employers. And who shares in the profits an employer gets? The shareholders. Well, the place to be in the last 25 years, until a few weeks ago, was the stock market. <laughs> Because that was how you, as an individual, participated in this boomerang. Working wouldn't get you much of that. And in fact, it got you none of that. But owning shares, that's where you would be. So anybody having to do with the business of handling profits, distributing profits, getting a piece of the profits, did well. The working class did not. Now let's follow the bouncing ball. 
What do you think happens to a working class like the Americans used to, for 150 years, rising wages, which will enable rising consumption, to suddenly find themselves in a situation they didn't understand, but they knew the wages weren't going up anymore. If you measure your own success, your own worth as a person, by what you consume, and you don't get the wages to pay for it, that is, the, out, the amount of money you get per hour doesn't go up, how the hell are you going to consume more? Americans did two things. The first thing American workers did to try to keep consuming more, even though their wages didn't go up, was work more hours. Statistic. Between the mid-70s and today, the average number of hours worked per year by an American worker rose about 20%. Over the same period of time, the average number of hours worked by a French, German, Italian, Swedish worker dropped by 20%. That's a stark difference. You notice it when you travel in those countries. Those people smile a lot. <laughs> they stop. During the day, they have time. They drink wine. <laughs> they look at the cheese. <laughs> you know, you know. And their cheese is not tummed in little slices between plastic. They're not in such a rush. You know? Italy is the place where the movement called, and I didn't make this up, slow food got underway as a response to the American horror of the fast food. So Americans went to work a lot. And you know, they didn't just work more hours, but they sent more members of the household out to work. Those are the 30 years in which the mass of American women that had defined themselves in terms of a home began to redefine themselves in terms of work outside the home, paid work. Retired people didn't anymore. They came back into the labor force. Young people worked. Americans worked themselves senseless. It, th it did some terrible things. It put unbelievable psychological strains on the American family because the woman being gone, having held it emotionally together so often, was now exhausted. The woman typically had what Arlie Hochschild, the wife of the speaker the other night here, uh, called the double shift. The woman who goes out to work a regular job, comes home, and is still the one who raises the kids, cleans the house, cooks the food, and so on. There may be a connection here between that fact and the fact that American women <coughs> consume more antidepressant drugs than any other population of either gender in any country on the planet. We also have the highest divorce rate in the world. And so there may be some connection. Parents and children barely recognize each other, and when they do, cross the street to avoid one another. Um, <laughs> there may be some connection here. Our families fell apart. We began to study and to celebrate even in our media, right? The dysfunctional family, ah, ha, 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 et cetera, et cetera. We worry about child abuse, sex abuse, spouse abuse. You fill in the blank. Uh, we are stressed. Was the extra work done enough to allow these workers to consume more? No. First, they discovered that if mother goes out of the house, you now have all kinds of new expenses. She has to have a proper outfit. She may have to have another car, and you start buying prepared food. Pretty soon, a large chunk of her income is eaten up by these other things. So the American working class did something else. They borrowed money like no working class in the history of this planet ever did before. From the mid-30s to the present, the American working class pioneered a level of debt, household debt, that still in most countries of the world hasn't begun to be equal. There are a few countries, though, in case any of you come from those, I want you to feel proud now. There are a few countries that have matched the American record. South Korea, Ireland, there are several. Remarkable. And they're falling apart now too quick. So Americans became indebted. And what happened in the family? Well, let's see. It's exhausted by all the work, and it's freaked out with anxiety about the debt. 
the American family is falling apart. Keep that in mind when you see the political point I'll come to later. What did the business community do? The business community's new problem was, my God, what a pot of profits. Wow. People got really excited. The way capitalists always do when there's a lot of money to be made and no end of it. They got really creative. <laughs> Alan Greenspan stood up in 1997 and announced, we are living in a new economy. What? In a new, and when you, when you looked and you read the article, I'm one of the 11 people who reads those kind of articles, and I read the article, and he meant, he, I, keep, I, I am not making this up, the economy just goes up. It doesn't go down. Now, I don't think today he would make this argument, but he made it for a while. It was very popular. He was very popular. He was considered the most powerful economic policy maker in the world. And you could see why he felt this way. This was getting wider and wider. The money to be made was fantastic. And as the business community struggled, how can we make money with all this money? Suddenly, salaries of top executives went nuts, right? People are angry about it now. Why? This is 30 years old. Suddenly, people are outraged. What? <laughs> what? What? What happened? Were you sleeping for 30 years? <laughs> you just woke up? What is this? Really bizarre. Huge salary. Why not? This is a... Bonanza! And then a group of financiers, people who specialize in how to make money out of money, that's what they do, came up with a brilliant solution to the question, how can we use this money at the same time that we keep the system going? And they came up with the brilliant solution. You know what? We'll take the profits that we got by freezing the wages, get ready now, because this is America, <laughs> and we'll lend the money to the workers so they can consume more. In that way, what the business has accomplished, not Wall Street, every business, Main Street, in the ghetto we do this too. The business accomplished something which businessmen normally only fantasize about in private moments in the executive toilet. <laughs> Instead of paying workers higher wages when they work harder and are more productive, you don't. Instead of raising their wages, you ready? You give them a loan, which they have to give you back with interest. Now, what, what could a capitalist, what's better than giving a worker, not a wage in it, which you've been doing for 50 years, but a loan? So business began to make a lot of money lending to the people who had to borrow because they didn't have any wages. The people who kept them from having the wages turned around and offered them a loan in a world in which they were desperate. This working class was desperate to borrow. They were the perfect borrowers. When they started borrowing, think, the American working class in those years was the richest working class on earth. More American workers owned their own home than any workers anywhere in the world. That means they were not only desperate to borrow to keep their consumption, they had collateral called mortgage of house. They could say to the lender, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give I'll give you my house as security. Lenders don't give you unless they get some security. Okay. Into this situation comes, inevitably, the financial community. Not because it created this, it didn't. But it feeds off of this. And here's the big new innovation they came up with. How, how can we lend to these poor workers who are desperate for consumption in such a way that it is secure? 
lateral of the house, a mortgage. But we are financiers. We just want to make the arrangement. To whom can we go to get the money that we're going to lend to the workers with the collateral of their houses? And the financiers hit upon a great idea about 20 years ago. That's really all. 20 years ago. They came up with a thing called securitization. Just to make sure you all understand. A bank takes a bunch of mortgages that it has arranged with John and Mary and Fred and so forth. And it puts them together in a bundle, it's called. They bundle the mortgage. And then they create a new kind of security, a new kind of stock. And if you buy that stock anywhere in the world, what you're getting is not a piece of a company. You're getting a piece of all the monthly payments made by all the mortgage holders in that bundle. You're getting literally a little bit from everybody's monthly payment, and there may be thousands of people in one bundle, thousands of mortgages. This proved to be a great idea. You could go all over the world, which the American financiers did, not just in the United States, all over the world, and you could say to people, I got a great investment for you. You give me your money, I will use your money to lend to people in America for housing. It's very good. American workers are rich. American workers have collateral. This is a good investment. And the financiers did what they always did. They kind of hyped it all. This is a great investment. These people are going to pay. These are Americans. They pay. Europeans, Asians, foreigners, to whom they went in greater numbers, were always skeptical. They fixed that problem. They went to three very important private companies in America, very successful. They're called Moody's, Standard & Poor, and Fitch. These three, they're private companies. These three companies, here's what they do. They rate the riskiness of all securities. So if you put together a bunch of mortgages and you created this thing I just described to you, it's called a mortgage-backed security, MBS, then you can only sell it around the world, get people to give you money for it, if it looked like one of those companies, Moody's, Fitch's, or Stanford, said, this is a triple A secure. So they went to these companies and they said, please do an objective study of the riskiness, and then attach the triple A. <laughs> and, all these, <laughs> and all these companies obliged, because that's where they make their living. In other words, these securities, backed by American mortgages, were re represented around the world as absolutely as safe as anything. They often had guarantees by American quasi-governmental agencies, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that you read about. By the way, there are going to be lawsuits for the next 10 years against movies, pictures, and standard of war, as all the people suffering now go after them for false assessment of risk. And you might be interested because we have saints in America, economic saints. One of them is named Warren Buffett, <laughs> who owns Moody's. Sometimes saints do terrible things. <laughs> so here became the problem. Banks got involved. There was money to be made. The whole rest of the world began sending its money to America because you got nice interest rate, absolutely secure, much more secure investment than you could have in your own little country. Do you know that in the period from 200 to 207, over half of the world's savings, of the world's savings, came to the United States? When you think about the efficiency of capitalism, think about that. Half of the money saved in Indonesia, and Nigeria, and Guatemala, and you name it, instead of being used to build up the schools, the roads, the infrastructure of those societies, it wasn't. It was collected by banks and their governments and invested in America to make more houses and more malls. The United States operated like a vacuum cleaner, soaking up the discretionary wealth of the world in order to enhance the housing market in the country that already had among the best housed people in the world. That's not efficiency. 
It's capitalism, but it's not efficient. It's also a capitalism that goes mad. The corruption spreads. Who is the biggest buyer of these Americans? Who lent the most money to the United States in the last 10, 15 years? Two countries. China, China and Japan. China and Japan. And if this goes down, those leaders are going to have a very hard time explaining to their people how and why they took, in the case of both of them, about a trillion dollars and didn't use it to do things in their own society, but used it to finance the United States, to lend money here. They bought not just securities backed by mortgages, they bought treasury securities, money borrowed by the government. That meant certain anomalies that some of you might want to think about. The Chinese government, strongly on record against the war in Iraq, financed it. It lent the money. If they hadn't lent the money, the United States government might have had to pay for the war in that other way, by taxing the people. In which case, the popularity of that war, already hovering around 20%, would have become minus 20%. <laughs> because a war that you're losing, that also costs you a lot of money, is a hard one. A hard one to sell. So this situation kept going. Workers worked harder and borrowed more money. Now comes the business community saying, as it watched this, these people are borrowing more and more money. The portion of their house that they own, as opposed to the bank owning, is getting less and less. This can't go on. They can't do more work. They're exhausted. So they're not going to have more to buy. They can't borrow anymore because they are at the limit. So they're not going to be... Here comes a punchline. This can't go on forever, which is true of every previous capitalist boom period. The history of capitalism is written by this, up and down. In economics courses, it's called the business cycle. That's a neutered kind of term. Boom and bust is what it used to be called. That's a little more dramatic. <laughs> up and down, up and down. And the down usually happens when you've gotten nutty about the profit possibilities and you've lost all sense of proportion. <laughs> we saw it first in the late 1990s. Suddenly, companies that had never made a profit, had no prospect of making a profit, and told the world they had no prospect of making a profit, were fetching two, three, four hundred dollars a share on the stock market as long as they had the word come, see when, in them. <laughs> And it came known as the dot-com bubble and then the dot-com burst. And it blew up in the spring of the year 2000. Because you couldn't keep sustaining a rising value of a company whose leaders told you, we're not going to make a profit in our lifetimes. But thank you for sending the money. Which they did. They did. To be fair to them, they did. It didn't matter. When that collapsed, our dream span man with his finger on the pulse of what's going on, <laughs> came in and said, oh my God, in the, in the fall of the year 2000, as the stock market went down. By the way, April 2000, NASDAQ, which is our most important stock market, was at a level of 5,000, the basic NASDAQ index. Today, today, it's about 1,800. <clears throat> Friends, these are numbers that, that come, have their only equivalent in the Great Depression. We came down from a high in April of 2000. Here it is eight years plus later, and we're not even half. We have never recovered from that collapse, but we got a stall. What Alan Greenspan did afterwards was drop interest rates further, faster than we had ever done before in American history, making it possible for the American working class to borrow more cheaply. So they did, and we had a housing boom, and it went as long as it could, five or six years of really good time, and now it's burst. It's over. And the problem isn't finance and sneaky bankers. The problem is our workers have no money, and they're physically exhausted, and they're in over their heads in debt, 
and they can't keep buying, but the whole world depends on them buying. Because they had a wild amount of money to buy with for a while. So the whole economy, the whole world economy, adjusted. China became a vast country to produce consumer goods for the United States. This is a period, this 30 years is a period of American workers with their flat wages beginning to realize, even with working more and even with borrowing money, that they simply could only sustain consumption if they could find, this is not a technical term, cheap shit. <laughs> cheap shit. And the Chinese, to their credit, understood, wait a minute, that's what we do. We make cheap shit. And we can do it just as well as the United States. And the Chinese understood. We have unbelievably cheap labor, and we have a good, well-disciplined workforce, and we have technical expertise. Oh, we have that. And we have a working class that is squeezed and needs to buy cheap stuff. The only problem for the Chinese was, how the hell do you distribute all that Chinese stuff into every American household? China had to find somebody who would act as the distributor of Chinese crap. Walmart. Walmart. If you, seriously, if you chart the rise of Walmart and you chart the rise of China, it looks like this, and the next one looks just like this. You'll notice it's exactly the same thing. Four times a year, the premier of China, for years it's been going on, four times a year, the premier of China and the president of Walmart meet in a lovely resort alternating between the United States and China where they sit around for a couple of days and are very nice to each other. Walmart is now the largest private employer in the United States. Walmart could not have done anything like that without China. And China could not have become the producer for the American people without Walmart. That is a marriage made from one point of view in heaven, the Walton family is very religious, and in the other point of view, well, they don't have that, so somewhere else for the Chinese. Okay. Now it all blows up. We're going to shift now. What do you do about it? It all has blown up. We have a recession, a global recession, because nobody's buying stuff anymore, and there's no prospect. It's not just that the finances boom, there's no consumers left. Everybody who produces stuff is unable to sell them. You want to see an example of the real economy? Look at the American automobile industry. It is now a 100% basket case. In the last two or three months, they can't sell anything. They thought they could only not sell those gas guzzlers. Not true. They can't sell anything. Nothing. They're already a third of the size they were a few years ago, and it's finished. There will be no cars. Just like there are no more televisions produced here, or cameras produced here, or watches produced here, there will be no more automobiles produced here. Finished. Done. And what's killing them is the American market. But U.S. cars don't sell much abroad. A little, but not much. It's mainly an American market. Finished. They can't. On and on and on. Americans can't buy. That's the underlying problem. They don't have the money, and no one's going to give it to them. And these people have squandered and wasted huge amounts, so they're not going to be buying either. There's no purchasing power. There's none in Main Street, and there's none in Wall Street. They all went belly up. So now what is to be done? And now I'll bring you to a close. There are three positions of what is to be done. I'm going to call one conservative, this is America, I'm going to call one liberal, and I'm going to call one socialist. And all the conservative and the liberal are different, and both of them are different from the socialist. What's the conservative view? Well, I admit, the discomfiture, the pain of the conservatives is a source for me of an immense joy. <laughs> 
these people, no, no, seriously, these people have been running the show in my discipline, in economics, for a good 35 years. People like Milton Friedman, who was ridiculed when I was a graduate student in the university as a kook by my professors, became Mr. Scientific Economist. It was amazing. Their view, just to help you remember as it fades into the memory, <laughs> their view was that the way you get prosperity and economic growth was by keeping the government out of your pocket. The government meddled, it screwed things up. The best thing is, let the market work. The market is, ready, a magical instrument that simply takes the resources and puts them in the hands of the most productive users without the government's rubby hands in there. So we should have private enterprise and free markets and their no limits will be in Alan Greenspan's new economy. That's what they did. And this was believed. <coughs> Reagan brings it kind of to the fore in America and it's been dominant among Republicans and Democrats ever since. Deregulate, get the government out. Cut taxes, get the government out. Everywhere. The United States went all over the world preaching to every country in the world, particularly when they had economic difficulty. You know why you have economic difficulty? <laughs> Too much government. When Asian economies collapsed in 1997, the United States rushed there to tell them that. When Russia had its problems in 1998 and earlier in 1989, in they came with a shock therapy of privatization, it was called, and free markets. So we had a period of privatization and free markets. And it hit the fan. It didn't work. Something went wrong. But be careful, folks. Here's another corrective. From the 1890s to the 1920s, we had a very deregulated capitalism here in America. Government did relatively little, taxes were relatively low, and it culminated in the roaring 20s, when Americans really got excited and had a lot of money. And then you all know something awful happened in 1929, and it lasted for a decade. From 29 to 39, Roosevelt, who by the way, just, I, I hate to do this, but I got to. <laughs> Roosevelt was elected on a platform of a balanced budget. He referred to himself as a fiscal conservative that we need to balance the budget. It was only because of massive suffering, the rise of the trade union movement in the CIO, of socialist and communist parties that began to be important political organizations in this country. That's why Mr. Uh, FDR. To make him a hero is really to get the history a little fuzzy here. Check it out. In any case, Mr. Roosevelt was forced, and we went from a deregulated economy to a regulated one. The government came in and forced things on the, on the businesses, forced them to have Social Security. Before the 1930s, there was no Social Security in America. Forced the, the, the companies to put aside money for unemployment insurance. Before that, there had been no unemployment insurance. The government hired hundreds of thousands of unemployed people and put them to work to build the, the national parks that some of you visit and to, to create uh, artistic activity, WPA, if you ever studied, the remarkable things that were done. All of those things were burdens on business. They had to pay for it. They were regular. You couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. They passed the rules on a bank something called the Glass-Steagall Act. The bank could only do certain things. They couldn't be the same as an insurance company. All these limits. And so we had, for 40 years, 1930s and 1970s, we had regulated capitalism. And then that uh, fell apart in the 1970s. Some of you were in New Yorkers in the 1970s. New York fell apart in the 1970s. Our economy really went into, and so we got rid of the regulated, and we had deregulated. And now, an awful lot of liberals have a hot new idea. Gee, they said. You know what we need? We need. I want you to laugh. That's the whole point. What we need after this dreadful deregulation is another bout of, and they even call it, re regulation. <laughs> 
that the government should run control these banks. The government should have oversight. The That's what they said in the 30s. Friends, our economy oscillates. Every other <coughs> capitalist economy in the world oscillates. You know why it oscillates? Because it contains the anger of the population. Brilliantly. How does it do that? It says to people, when the economy <coughs> bites you in the rear end, okay, you're right. Like people today are saying, as they watch the stock market disintegrate into the toilet, as they watch every city and every state government having no revenue to pay for anything, as all of those of you that work in the school system or any other public service find the new fees and you know it, it's already happening, people get upset very important how people get upset. What they decide to focus their upset on. Sometimes people's upset can be nicely focused on a small little group and you beat them up. That's fun, well, you know. Black people or Hispanic people or gypsies, that's uh, things like that. But there's another kind of scapegoating that isn't about a group. It's the scapegoating of you see what our problem is? We deregulate. And the solution, therefore, is to regulate. regulate. All my liberal friends, three people, um, and, all my, and all my leftist friends, which is a large number, not all of them, but most of them, which is tragic, are talking like this. They want regulation. They want the government to come in there. That's not a socialist response. And I'm going to conclude by trying to explain to you why a socialist response is different, and even more important, why a socialist response is better and indispensable. Here's how it goes. In the Great Depression, which is our great example, we went from a deregulated economy that had hit the wall in 1929, and we regulated. We told businesses how to price things. We told businesses that they had to put aside money for unemployed workers and for social security and for pensions and for all kinds of things. But here's what no regulation did. No regulation then and no regulation proposed by liberals and leftists now does it either. Here's what it didn't do. It never interfered with the basic structure of a capitalist enterprise. That structure remained the same. What is that? At the top of every capitalist enterprise is something called a board of directors. 